Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, we have two mayflies, the Bubble May and the Muddle May. The, <laughs> the Bubble May, if you haven't heard of it before, it's because it didn't have a name until yesterday. And we're going to continue our weekly tips. This one will be more on the Biford Hackle. Welcome to you all. We're the Beatties from Boise, Idaho. I'm Al Beattie, and this lovely lady is my wife, Gretchen. Anyway, the fly that we're going to tie tonight started in 1985. Naturally, it's got a dry fly hook. I'm going to use gray thread, but it, it's thread to match whatever bug you're going to do. I'm using moose body hair right now. I also bleach the moose when I want to want to tie it in lighter colors like PMD colors and so forth. Uh, the body is dubbing gray in this in this case. The wings are wonder wings. I'm going to use grizzly, but again, you'll adjust that based on what you're trying to trying to imitate. The collar is deer hair, spun and stacked, and the head is deer hair, spun and trimmed. And this is what we'll be working with tonight. Um, don't let me forget, I'm going to not set my thread over at the vise just yet. We need to talk about that. But we got moose. As you can see, I have a pretty good sized piece of hair, and this is spinning hair comes off of the rib of the animal. You all have been through this presentation a number of times, so I'm not gonna go through it again, but that's one complete piece uh, from, our, from our box of spinning here. Uh, we're gonna be using just some hen hackle cape feathers for the wonder wings. I'll set that over at the, at the vise. Got hooks. I've already sprayed everything down with static guard. Hopefully the it, the static electricity won't be too bad, but it's been pretty tough. And right here, I wanted you to see something. And this is a, my bobbin. And I noticed that I've got an O-ring installed. That O-ring is to keep my thread from coming unthreaded. I can't tell you how many shows Gretchen and I have traveled to that we get to the show and all of our bobbins are unthreaded. Well, let's take a look at this over at the vise. And John, as you can see, the, the O-ring is installed, thread is under it. And when I get ready to tie, I just pull the thread out from under the O-ring and I'm ready to tie. At the end of the fly, rather than just laying it down, I pull the O-ring off, shove it back over to capture the thread. That way, when I get to Fresno next week or wherever the heck I'm going, it'll still be together. I don't know where Fresno came from. It's been quite a while since I did a show in Fresno. But anyway, <laughs> we'll set this down for the moment. Let's get the uh, roadmap fly out. And this is a muddle may. And it's a size 10 that I'll tie it in tonight. And this is the ones that, about the size I like to fish. Uh, 14s and, um, and 16s. I do a few 18s once in a while, but I'm getting my eyes are getting to the point where doing an 18 isn't uh, as easy as it once was. But anyway, that's a 14 and they still go together pretty easy for me. Set that down. Let's, uh, let's go to the books. This muddle may is from our book, Tying Hair Wing Flies. It's in the top row, second from the right. But anyway, we have books available on our website, btsflyfishing.com. You can contact me via email, lbd2, and it's a Gmail account. Or you can go to Amazon, type Gretchen BD Books in the search engine, and it'll take you to our library page. But anyway, back at the vise, we're going to take a, a good look at this fly. First, I want you to notice that the hackle is um, deer hair. The head is spun deer hair, spun and trimmed. Moose tail, wonder wings. And I want you to notice the wonder wings are tilted back in more the orientation of a natural mayfly rather than uh, like a lot of dry flies where the wings are pushed straight up like, like this. The actual mayfly tends to be kind of straight in the front and then the rest of the wing tilts towards the back. One of the things we need to talk about that after, after tying that first fly in 1985, it took me the better part of a year of fishing it to figure out how to balance the darn thing. 
And it's when I first discovered something I probably should have known for years, but up until that time, I had just followed recipes. Tail, long as the shank. Wing, long as this. Hackle, long as that. Okay, that, that's the way I tied all my flies. And, and then I got to working with this fly and it really had no recipe. And I found out why some of the proportions are the way they are. It balances the fly so it'll land on the water right. As an example, I want you to notice this tail is much skinnier than an average hair tail. Well, I had to make up for that. I said, well, I, I wanted a mayfly to look nice and slender like the real mayfly does. And my imitation should have, well, if I take out some of the hair, and that's the first thing I discovered, I took out some of the hair and the fly started falling on its nose in the water. I said, well, geez, that's no good. I mean, I could give it a quick snap just as it just got to the water and it would, the snapping of the, of the leader would, would set it out flat on the water. But why was that? Well, I got to thinking about it and I said, well, you know, I took some of the weight out when I made the tail skinnier. Maybe if I made it longer, it would balance the fly out. And it did mostly. And we're gonna talk about something that you can't even see right now. It looks like that wing comes straight out of the back of the hackle, doesn't it? Let me just turn that around so you can take a look. Well, it doesn't. And that little part took me a while to figure out too. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. But for right now, I'll just take this guy out. Now tonight I'll be tying with 6-0 thread. That's what I usually do for this. Uh, when I usually at about size eights and sixes and fours of the muddle me, I'll switch to 3-0 thread for spinning the, the head. Now I'm gonna, this one is kind of at the crossover point. I'll try it with 6-0. If I break it, I'll go back and I'll put some 3-0 on. But anyway, I'll just put on a quick thread base, back to the end of the shank, and back to the middle of what I call the body area. And that's that area right there that's got thread on it. Now back over at the materials, I'm gonna get a, a bundle of the, of the moose. Now that normally would be a bundle that I would have for a regular tail. You can see that it's a pretty good sized bundle. Well, I'm gonna end up throwing about half of that away and then we'll stack this and figure out what parts we're gonna keep and what part we won't. But there I've got the trash cleaned out. All I did is over at the waste bin is did this routine. All of you know that, but if there's some new people signing on, you'll at least know that that's how we <clears throat> clean out the trash is by flipping our finger up and down through the waste end or the, the butt end there. All right, <clears throat> I'll stack that. Put that aside. Now what I'm going to do is grab this clear out on the butt ends. And you can see right here, all of those that are shorter than, I'm just going to get rid of those. I need to get it down to stuff that's about the same. And there's one of the things that I have found, the consistency of those shorter ones is just a little different than the consistency of those longer ones. And I want you to notice what a nice straight fibered tail I have out of the deal. So I think that has to do with the fibers that I threw away and the fibers I kept. Okay. Measure it for length, and I want this tail to be the length of the complete hook. Set that in place. Drop it down on the side of the hook next to me. Loose turns, tight turns, roll it on top. All right, get down here to the... Now, I want to have a turn under the tail. If I do that from this location at the back of the hook, it will cause, cause my tail to push over to the side because of the anchoring position here at the back of the hook. So let me move forward to an anchoring position in the middle of the hook. Now I'll make my turn around. And why is it you're doing that? For some reason, tying this fly, I keep pushing the tail down. I don't know why I don't on other flies, but ever since I started tying the darn thing, I have trouble with that, with the tail ending up down after I get done fiddling around with everything. So that one turn of thread kind of keeps it from, from that happening. Okay. Now I'll trim off this waste. That waste is important, as you'll see when Gretchen gets to the, uh, the bubble fly or the bubble may. Get rid of that, wrap forward, and get back to the place where I want to tie my hackle in. 
I can see I got a problem already. I didn't leave myself enough room for the head. So instead of coming back to my hackle position being right there, I'm gonna back up just a little bit to right there. That's about how much room I need for the, for the head. <clears throat> now I'll get over here and just get a bundle of this, this spinning hair, if you will. And I'm glad I sprayed everything down with static guard. It's still sticking a little bit, but anyway. <clears throat> There we go. All right. Now, we need just a little bit more hair, maybe twice the amount of hair that we had in the tail in the, in the wing. Maybe it's three times as much. It's, it's hard to gauge volume when you're looking at a real hollow hair like this comparing it to a really dense hair like the like the moose so there's your comparison right there yeah i know on a regular hair wing fly i would want it to be twice the size of the tail i can't quite do that with this one i got a couple of bad fibers right here let me get rid of them there I go now i'm going to measure this for as long as the shank plus the eye and tie that in place and i'm really going to Bail into it. I want that to flare a lot. And I'm really, really, I'm almost to the point of breaking that thread. I don't know if you can see it or not, but you can see I have a I have a really good tight application of thread right there. And I'm just gonna trim off. There we go. I'll just switch this up here and trim a couple of those off. All right, good. <clears throat> now, I want you to notice how I hold my fingers right up against that waist. What I'm doing is I'm doing this routine with my fingers and it's my thumb gets it. Let me switch off to the side. I do that routine, but, but you're not gonna be able to see it because in order to make it happen, but I'm, what I'm doing is laying the thread right in and slowly working my way back over those waist ends and i want to really pull them into and pull them into the body itself and to do that is i'm actually using the tip of that finger right there to guide those that into there but like i said you're not going to be able to see it because i can't be guiding and not be get in get in front of the camera and it don't make any difference which which way I put my camera, I still am going to have that trouble. There we go. And there we go. Good. You see how that kind of pulls that all together? And I actually compress that hair a lot to where it, it looks like about the same volume as the tail. And that's part of what I know. Volume is a problem with this because now I'm going to stack a wing on top of that as well. I want you to notice where this is hanging. It's hanging right at the dividing line between the waist from the hackle and the waist from the tail. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and I'm just going to do wonder wings. I've done every kind of wing on this fly that, that you can imagine. Hackle point wings work pretty good, but I've finally settled on wonder wings is working real good and I don't have to dig through a cape looking for the for the match pair, I can grab just about anything and make a match pair out of them. And I'm going to tie these in short, just like you do with all Wonder Wings, with three snug turns, and I'm going to pull them out to the length that I want them to be. I want you to notice that I take my, I'm sorry, it's my flip off finger, but anyway, I rest it right against the, the eye of the hook. So I don't pull too hard and end up pulling that hackle completely out of the, from under the thread. It's kind of a, break if you will it, it allows me to now i want that just about as long as the hackle and the hackle is just a little bit long as far as the hook shank it's just a little bit longer than the hook shank and that looks pretty good a couple of wraps there now i want you to notice that the space there well that's a little bit too much space so i'm going to wrap a little bit forward not much okay that's about right that space is really important 
that I do not, let me see if I can rotate this so you can better see it. You see the, the space there? That space right here is the difference between this fly falling on his nose and not falling on his nose because conventional wisdom would have all of us taking that wing right up to the base of the hackle, right? I mean, why would you leave a space like that? Well, it doesn't show, but it positions the weight of the wing material back a little bit on the on the hook shank, which allows the, well, it balances the fly so it'll land on the water right. Let me trim out the waist from the, from the wings. Wrap over that. Now here's something that often happens. You know that little bump right back here in the dividing line between the hackle and the tail, the waist from the tube? It isn't always a consistent even bump. And sometimes it'll cause your wings to twist one way or the other. And I don't really need to do anything. I happen to get a really nice even bump, but I'm gonna show you this anyway. <clears throat> what you do is that let's say that those, these wings had twisted a little bit. As I take a loop around the whole wing, a loose loop. And now I can tighten. And I, in fact, you can start to see that that wing is in fact turning a little bit towards the camera, which I don't want. But I can control the way those wings set, even though they have an un, uneven base, if you will. And they're showing you all this. I managed to screw myself all up, but that's all right. There we go. <clears throat> now, here's another. Remember the anchor point that we had? for putting the, the thread under the tail. Well, I have another place that I needed to make it have thread control my fibers, and that's the underside of the hook. Otherwise, as I'm spinning hair, these fibers will cross under the wing, under the hook, and I don't want that to happen. So I'm just gonna use the anchor point behind the wings, and this time I'll pull forward to keep my hackle up on top, and then I'll go back to that anchor point and you can see now that that maybe uh, right right there you can see pretty good that 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 positions all that hair up on top of the shank. Now let me <clears throat> wrap a thread down right up against the base of those wings. That's too much. Let me trim out the waist. It's not waste. Remember now, it's future flies. I'll just put that in my clip, set it aside. Let's see how my wings are doing. Wings are looking pretty good. Yep, yep, we're on our way. Now it's time for some dubbing. Already, and we'll twist that W in one direction. Notice I'm keeping the application very slender. This is a mayfly. I don't. There's the only fat mayfly I've seen in this world is a is a um, green drake. The rest of them tend to have pretty slender bodies. And even compared to a lot of other bugs, the green drake has got a pretty slender body, but a, a lot more robust than many of the mayfly species. So you can see that I'm getting a, keeping that profile pretty sparse. Now I'm going to dub between the wings and the hackle. Tilt that so you can see that a little bit better. There you go. <clears throat> now I'm going to push my hackle back and I'm using my thumbnail to kind of spread it so that it goes around the wings and there's not near as much on top as there is more to the sides. I'm gonna pull that back and wrap a thread dam in front. That thread dam is important and we'll talk about it. I've got an 80% chance that I'm gonna need it. And I'll explain that to you here in a minute until after I get it done. Okay, now I'm, the thread dam pushes my hackle back. I'm going to advance my thread now to the front of that dam because that's where my first spin will be. What that does is gives me a little bit of space under the head hair, if you will. 
that when it comes to trimming that head tight up against the hackle, let me get my fly here. You can see that, that the head is trimmed really tight right up against that hackle. Well, the only way I can keep from not cutting that hackle off when I'm trimming the head is that I'll tilt my scissors down so that the tips cross in that hollow space left by that thread. So that's what I'm, it may look like I'm cutting right up next to the hackle, but I'm actually pushing down so that it, it crosses right there. You kind of get what I'm getting to. Anyway, I'm gonna get back over and get another bundle of hair and get rid of the waste. All right, I've got this pretty well cleaned out. I don't need to stack it. I just wanna make sure that I've got all good hair here and that I don't have too much. You overdress it in this first spin can be kind of a pain in the neck. Now I'm just gonna put it in, in on, on the side of the hook there, cinch it up, pull the hair out to the side, cut it off and spin. All right, good. Now I've got a little bit, that's a little bit tight there, but I think I can, I'll be able to get another spin in there. Yeah, yeah, after I use my hair packer, it uh, packs it back pretty good. There we go, yeah, I'll get another spin. <laughs> All right, but I won't grab quite as much hair this time. Smaller amount. And it's going to not want to spin quite as well as, uh, as it did before because uh, I'm spinning up against what I call a wall. And what's the wall? The wall is the previous spin. Whenever you spin here, if you want to have success without a, without a whole lot of frustration, you always want to be spinning slightly in front of the wall. Well, I don't have any room. As you can well see, I got very little room there in front of the wall. So I'm spinning right up against the wall. And my hair is going to drag along that wall. and probably not do a real good job of spinning, but that's all right. We'll do the best we can. And now I'll give it a good hard twist to make it go into place because the wall is slowing things down and that gets it just about the way I want it. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, a half hitch, another, a third, a double, which is a whip finish, another double, which is a whip finish. So it's three singles and two doubles. Now I'll just take and cut that off. And let's see what we got. Well, right now to probably all of you out there, it looks like a mess. It is, but we'll, we'll bring it under control. Let me start by pushing all the hair up here. All right, now the first thing I'm gonna do is reach over here on, a, on the pegboard right next to, out, out, of, out of sight here, but right next to my tying area and get my chef's brush for cleaning up the mess that I'm gonna make. <clears throat> and I'll start by just flipping the vise over and trimming flat along the bottom. Now you should be able to see that I've, I've got a pretty good flat area for the head. The rest of the head gets trimmed the same. One clip in the front, one, one, okay, here's how we do it. One clip right here, one clip right there. One in front. And we just keep going around. All right, that's looking pretty good. Now these right here, I can just lay the scissors in and cut the ones along the bottom pretty much straight across. But now we're gonna be getting into those. Okay, right over here is an example. There's some that we need to get to. And 
I can trim them one of two ways. Remember the, uh, the thread dam that I left? Well, we're gonna use the thread dam on some of these. And so I'll show you two ways to, to trim that. One with the thread dam and one without. And I'm gonna start by using the, the thread dam method of these right up here on top. Press down and cut. Cuts up right next to that hackle and doesn't, and doesn't damage it. Now I got a couple right here down on the edge, end of the hackle, it's pretty tough to do that and not cause damage. So I'll just, there we go, good. Now here's some right here. They're up on top again, tight against the hackle. Can they see Gretchen? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna just press down so that my tip, scissor tips are crossing right there in that space, if you will, created by the thread dam. And I got some hackle that I damaged anyway, so I'll cut that out. That's why I always have to make sure I've got plenty. And after I clean some of the waste materials out of that with my chef brush, we've got a number 10 muddle bay. And there it is. Any questions? I've got one, Al, if I can. I'm I sorry. Some, I, I have a question. I have a question, Al. Hey, I'm looking looking forward to it, Robin. <laughs> um, when you just before you start to trim the hair, have you ever come across the idea of steaming it in front of a kettle so it fluffs it all up before trimming? I came across that somewhere a while back. I was wondering if it actually works. So it, it, it's supposed to make the trimming of the head a bit easier. Jesus, Robin, that is a hell of an idea. And you know what? No. And you know what? Tomorrow it's going to happen here in, in Boise, Idaho, and I'll have a report next week. You can make a cup of tea at the same time. Oh, well, of course. Of course. <laughs> yes. I have a cup of tea on a regular basis here. So, yes, I sure will. Any other questions? That fly, by the way, is dynamite. Uh, the heavy western water riffles. I yeah. caught a nice fly. Nice. Not I mean, a nice, nice fish. Uh, what, what in Missoula, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it that's when just... I when I first introduced her to the flight, we were still going together. And anyway, <clears throat> have you ever uh, thought thought about putting a, a plastic dam between your hackle and the and the head you're trimming? You know, like a and a guard, like a guard. You know, like used to make hackle guards for parachutes yeah. that way. Yeah, I I know what you're talking about. I've tried that, and the truth of the matter is that size 10, it works pretty well, but when you get down to a 16 and an 18, there just ain't any room for it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Comment oh, comment. Your technique for trimming the head reminds me of Don Putterbaugh's method of tying the mini muddler minnow trimming the head. Well, it's a could very well be. I know who Don Putterball was. I never met him. And I think he was a little bit before my time. But anyway, here's another one. Do you have scissors just for hair? Uh, we have scissors just for hair. They're called whisk clips. We got several different kinds. They're, they all have replaceable blades. And when we're really tying a bunch of uh, hair wing stuff, but when we're in, in, in our production modes, which don't happen very much anymore. But when we're in a production mode, we'll get a couple of weeks out of, out of a set of blades before we just throw them away and get another set. And so no, I don't resharpen the scissors. Sometime you need to show them how many of your wonderful stackers you have. Oh, that's for another time. <laughs> hey, you guys all know about my good stacker. I got 24 of those. When, I, when I'm doing uh, fly bodies, to pass off to her to put on the hackle, I'll stack 24 wings and 24 tails. And that's kind of how we keep track of the, the dozens. We just keep tying until the stackers are, are empty. And I said, well, there's a dozen and put a stroke on the, on the cork board and pass them over to her and go on to the next one. But anyhow, anything else? 
Actually, Don was my mentor, John Wright. Oh, whatever I know about fly fishing, he taught me. He passed away last June at the age of 92. 90, yeah, wow. Wow. Good to know. Any other questions? Well, this fly is, it's almost impossible to sink it, but yet it has the slender profile of a mayfly. All that said, when you get right down to it, uh, I'll tie that fly for you commercially, but you better be ready to pony up 25 bucks a fly because I really don't want to tie the darn thing, but for $25, I will. And I don't tie it. Yeah, no. It's uh, <laughs> what we do and what we have found is we have a plan B fly that's fish is the same, almost, almost the same, and it's a heck of a lot easier to tie. And that's the, the newly named fly as of yesterday. Used to be the easy muddle may. Now it's called the bubble may. And Gretchen is going to take care of that. We'll switch positions here. You want me to put your, your fly in the, in the vice? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, yeah. I'll put a hook in there and we'll just hold the fly. How's okay, that? I'll do that. Yeah. Because you've got that thing ratcheted down again. I do. <clears throat> Obviously, I don't tie with advice like that when we're tying because it's too hard for me to work. I use my own. I just think I've got my old Patriot in right now. Yep. Okay. There's your. There's your two um, sample okay. flies. And oops, I'll duck under. Good. <clears throat> Here's your tea, and I'll swap tea with you. Okay. Okay. I get to do the easy one. That's my role. <laughs> Al, did you have some chats there? Did I have some what? Chats. Yeah, we just we just went through them. Um, we had Mike Kelly said interesting fly. John Wright said Al, I like your technique for trimming. Tim Cavalier, do you have scissors just for hair? And I answered that. And then and then the one about Don Putterpaw. And are there others? No, that's all. Okay, um, this is the fly that I'm going to be tying. As you can see, it, it has some similar characteristics. It's done with poly. <clears throat> and if you are a purist, this is a really pretty fly. You can do the same thing with CDC. Our uh, standard hook. We're going to use the same gray thread that Al was using and the same moose body hair and the same dubbing. And the difference is, is we'll be using some poly for the, uh, for the wings. Let's see, there we go. And I've got it all combed out, ready to go. Okay, I'm going to start the base wrap about two eye lengths back from the eye and go to the bend and back again. <clears throat> now my rule on this one is, is I go to where I started and then I'm gonna take a couple turns back. Because when I put that tail on, when I, uh, well, actually that isn't true now because I don't, but, but I'm concerned about crowding the, the portion that I have here for my bubble. And I practiced that fly today and had several issues with that. The other issue I have is, is making sure that I don't get too much moose. I tend to overdress the tails of this fly because I'm used to tying a hair wing. I can stack it. Okay, I'm gonna take a hold of this right at the, the tip so that I can see where the, the long fibers are and the short fibers. So I'll take a hold of it right here and get rid of all those short ones. You notice they even look different on the butts a little bit. They yeah. often are whiter, yep. crinklier. 
they're just a little different. So now I think I have about the right amount of, and look at how nice that tail looks already. So I'm gonna measure from the bend to the eye, because I want the long slender. Come back here to the tie-in point, take my easy wraps, and tighten down. Now, the tight wraps will cause the hair to flare as you can see by the butt ends. So as I go back, I'm taking looser, looser wraps and those are shaping wraps that shapes the tail. Yeah. <clears throat> what I do at this point is I'll take this and lift it up. And as you can see, I'm further back than I planned, so I'll just come up here and take some wraps and get back where I need to be. I'd rather do that than crowd the eye. Or if, if you can't just, recover when the eye is crowded. You can't recover yeah. very well, can you? No. <clears throat> At this point, I kind of like to just take this and trim these off just a little bit so I kind of have similar sizes. And I'm leaving those. So now I'm going to tie uh, on my dubbing. Something that I've just learned recently about dubbing, and as much as I've used it, you'd think I wouldn't have anything else to learn, but yeah, keep learning as you tie. I used to stroke my wax like that on my thread up and down. Well, that tends to cut it. But if you notice, when you just touch it, you're, you're still getting the wax on there and you're not cutting it so bad. So that's my, my new way of applying wax. So you might keep that in mind. Again, very slender. Twist it, and I'm going to wrap my dubbing. Back to the tail. Be real careful when you get back here because you don't want to ratchet down on it and mess up your nice slender tail. Right up to this point, and I've run out of dubbing, and I want just a tiny bit more. <clears throat> okay, what I'm going to do now is take a look at these and divide. Try to get about half and half. And I think I just one more there. That looks pretty good. I'm going to crisscross through these. Pull them back. Okay. Now at this point, I kind of like to push down on it. Take those back and you can see. I want the, these as long as right to the bend. So I'll just cut these off. And I generally don't get them all at once, but if I get them measured, then I can come back this way trim the rest of them to match. Okay, I'm gonna push down on it, keep them back. Now I'm going to get my poly that I've combed out already. And I would just wanna be sure that I have enough to tie it on and I like to tie it. Oh, let me put it a little. Sometimes I forget to put a little base wrap on there and it makes it hard. So I want to get right up to where I want my bullet head to start. So I'm going to tie right in there. I'm going to lift it up. I've got a little more space right there than I 
choose to have. So I'm going to take another wrap, come back. Trim it. It's almost too big for this one, but I can still use it. Now I want to whip finish that. Just right there. Trim off the excess thread. I want this at an angle like this. I'm gonna come under here, trim that. And I want it about as long as the, I'm, I'm looking at the bend, so I'm cutting it off about that same length. There's always a few calcitrant fibers there that I have to uh, Okay. Legs flat out to the side. So I'm going to pull these out a little bit. Okay, that is done. One of the things that we found about that one, it's sometimes good to place a little drop of glue right at the junction point between the wing and the bubble head, and then pull up on that and allow the glue to dry. And what that does is just a kind of stiffens the the base end of those materials so that wing stays in the upright position rather than laying down after it gets wet and cast a few times. And remember that you can do it with CDC. I suppose there's actually a lot of materials you could do it with. Maybe CDC, you could probably even do some, I don't know. If you take Chickaboo, we Chickaboo. often substitute mm -hmm. CDC with Chickaboo that's been treated with silicone spray. And uh, that makes it just a waterproof feather. It's very similar to the CDC. And that works very well. Now that, that fuzzy patch up there, I probably used a half a can of that spray on it. I just hosed wow. them down to where they were just sopping wet. And then I hung <laughs> that up to let it dry for a couple of days. And after it was dry, you can't sink that stuff. So that's just a, that is a handy substitute, if you will, for CDC, and you know that's mm -hmm. even a pretty good color for to replace. Yeah, CDC. it is. You can get that from Whiting Farms or anybody that raises chicken. We already been through the the class on this. This area right here is the breast feathers, and this is the crotch area of the birds with the legs on either mm -hmm. side. Now we're to the weekly tip, and we're going to talk to you more about the Biford hackle style. Anyway, what I'm going to show you right now is plan b but we're still calling it the biford the biford type of hackling method you notice that i've got a, a piece of yarn tied to the bottom of the hook i think you can probably figure out what's going to happen even before i do it okay and i'll just set that let that hang right there and I just realized that I got to attach my thread. You know, it's going to be difficult <laughs> to hack. But you know what? One of the things that I've learned, if you don't have thread, crazy glue can do some wonderful things for you. But I don't want to have to use crazy glue right now. All right. All right, here we go. All right, we'll just uh, pull that back. Now, what I'm gonna demonstrate for you next is one of two techniques we actually use for the, what we call the more natural footprint on the water. And uh, then next week I'll uh, demonstrate the other one. 
but for right now, let me just half hitch this off. Return this towards you so you can see. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to just kind of divide the, that hackle a little bit. Pull that dubbing forward, but I'm just going to pull this piece of yarn forward. And that's that's the, the system that we actually we actually use rather than crisscrossing the dubbing. All right. Get my whip finish tool. And I'm obviously this is a size 10, but um, let me let's see if tell me if that isn't just a little bit more of that natural footprint that I've been telling you that I wanted. That gives it a, a little bit kind of sitting down on the water. Let me get a something to set that on. I've got a and you can see that guy sits there pretty darn nice up there on the on those tackle points. I like to okay, one of the things that I need to mention too, I like to tie this with larger than the hook size hackle. For the very reason you see right there is the it will set up on the tail and on the hackle tips uh when it's tied with a little bit larger hackle let me put that back in the vise and i'll explain to you why all right i'll get this out of the way now i'm i used one size larger see this is a 10 hook i use size eight hackle and one of the things that's uh well the act of pulling it up to the side for some crazy reason, I don't know why, seems to shorten it. Maybe it's the dimension of the strip that I laid along the bottom of the of the yarn. I don't know. The other thing you need to know, this is a size 10. When I tie it in 14, 16s and 18s, of course, I have to take and split this uh, yarn into smaller strips. I mean, it's a, you, you'll uh, have to figure out just which works better for you, but but that's the one right there that that'll give you the what I when I call a really nice natural footprint on the water. 